Thank you all very much for uh, coming out here today. I'm uh, really delighted to see so many people here and, and to be able to um, to be able to, to kick this event off. Uh, my name is Dan Berger. I teach at uh, UW Bafo campus, and it is my extreme pleasure to welcome Oscar Lopez Rivera to Seattle and to the University of Washington for the first time since his release from prison three years ago. I want to open uh, with a quote from the scholar and activist Laura Briggs, who wrote, quote, Puerto Rico is the most important place in the world. Puerto Rico has been a laboratory for US colonialism. And the US has used Puerto Rico for everything from pharmaceutical testing and forced sterilization to the policing of dissent and military target practice. More recently, a US-imposed financial board has implemented devastating austerity measures across the island. And these austerity measures joined with the callous response from both the US and uh, Puerto Rican governments after Hurricane Maria and other climate catastrophes are things that we've been seeing playing out with particular devastation. Yet Puerto Rico is not just a site of colonial violence. It is also a place of beauty and transformation, of struggle and determination. It is a site of resistance and resilience. It is a 5,000 mile long island that ended military testing and freed several successive generations of political prisoners. It is an island of ecological cooperatives, feminist collectives, and student strikes. Just seven months ago, hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans filled the island's streets demanding that a blatantly corrupt governor resign. They stayed in the streets for two weeks, dancing and marching and singing and demanding until that governor resigned. This too is Puerto Rico. And there's no greater guide to that dynamic than Oscar Lopez Rivera. Born in San Sebastian, Oscar moved to Chicago as a child. He was drafted into the military at 18 and sent to Vietnam. He returned to the United States in 1967, shaken by the racism that he saw in Vietnam as a reflection and continuation of that uh, racism that he saw and experienced in Chicago. He became a community organizer, working for better housing, education, and jobs for the Puerto Rican community. He helped establish an alternative community high school in 1972, uh, the award-winning and still running Pedro Albizu Campos High School. And he worked to free five Puerto Rican nationalist political prisoners who had been incarcerated since the 1950s and were freed uh, in 1979. In 1981, he was arrested and charged with seditious conspiracy. Seditious conspiracy is an odd charge. It makes it a crime to work with others in advocating the overthrow of US authority and has been used against Puerto Rican independence activists since the 1930s. And not just Puerto Ricans. Seditious conspiracy is the charge that sent Nelson Mandela to prison in South Africa. Uh, which is why by the 21st century, many people were calling uh, Oscar the Nelson Mandela of the Americas. Oscar was sentenced to serve 55 months in prison. He spent 12 years and four months of that time in solitary confinement, subject to the, most cruel, to the, to the extreme cruelties of US experiments in supermax forms of isolation. Yet his spirit and love for humanity remained unbroken then as it does today. He became a talented painter, and his, and his rich portraits of life, justice, and joy traveled the world. His release was supported by every political faction on the island of Puerto Rico and from a broad international human rights campaign that garnered support from across the world. Ultimately, in his final days in office, Barack Obama commuted his sentence, and Oscar left prison in May of 2017. He returned to Puerto Rico and has been on the front lines of organizing there against debt, climate change, and colonialism. He now operates a foundation that is, among other things, helping to train a new generation of organizers. He joins us in Seattle as the first stop on a speaking tour of the Northwest. This afternoon, he's going to be in conversation with Renee Schenk, the program coordinator of a bilingual teacher preparation program here at UW, and someone who grew up in the movement for Puerto Rican self-determination. Her parents were activists that supported Puerto Rican political prisoners, and Renee has carried on that work, so much so that she flew to Puerto Rico uh, to accompany Oscar on uh, a surprisingly long journey yesterday um, that uh, landed them here 12 hours later than they were supposed to. Um, so before I, I turn the, the floor over to them, I want to first offer my deepest thanks to everyone who made this event possible. I want to thank the Hen Henry Art Gallery for hosting us today, uh, including Mita Mahado and especially Ian Saporin for seeing too many uh, <coughs> logistical items over the last several weeks. 
Um, and also I want to encourage everyone uh, to visit the, the South Gallery of the Henry after today's talk. They're going to have it open for an extra hour um, from 3 to 4. So when you're done uh, buying books uh, afterwards, please, please do visit. Um, I also want to thank the other co-sponsors, including the Comparative History of Ideas program, the Departments of Geography and History, uh, the Simpson Center for the Humanities, and the Washington Institute for the Study of Inequality and Race. And I want to thank Noelia Arzan for helping organize uh, his visit today, including tonight's program uh, at Geo's Bar and Grill. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so Renee and Oscar are going to be in conversation for about a half hour. Um, hopefully we'll have some time for, for Q&A after that. And then Oscar will be signing copies of his books, Between Torture and Resistance, and Cartas a Carina, both of which are available for sale outside by, um, by Left Bank Books and um, and, and others, uh, and, and I uh, encourage you to visit that literature table, uh, not only for those books, but also for more information about local events and ways you can support Puerto Rico here in Seattle. Um, but for now, please join me in welcoming Oscar Lopez Rivera and Renee Schenk. Oscar, since 2017, Puerto Rico has faced a Category 5 hurricane, a callous response by both the U.S. government and the government of Puerto Rico, and more recently, a series of earthquakes. Mass demonstrations forced Governor Rosselló to resign last summer, yet evidence of larger corruption remains. What is the mood in Puerto Rico today? Well, unfortunately, uh, the mood in Puerto Rico from, from one moment to the next change. I think that up to July of uh, last year, the, the mood was very dynamic, very, very, very happy, very, from, from uh, Hurricane Maria to that moment, a, a big change occurred in Puerto Rico. Especially, especially uh, when we saw young people in Puerto Rico, for the first time, a lot of young women, a lot of young men, but primarily more women than men struggling to get rid of a governor who did never deserve to be to be in that position. I don't know how he got elected because I wasn't there, but it, it, it was a disgrace. It was a disgrace for that man to have been elected. <clears throat> then, the the right now with the with the uh, terremoto with the earthquake, uh, attitude has changed again. We see a lot of Maria in the uh, terremoto. We see it because Puerto Rico did not have the wherewithal, the conditions, the, 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 the things that are needed to face a situation like that. Uh, it was completely, completely uh, unexpected. And we can see the pain of the people, especially people who, have, who lost their homes, who are outside of their homes, who are uh, living in, in conditions that are very inhumane conditions. So from one moment to the next, we see this painful situation that Puerto Ricans are facing right now. We, we saw Maria, uh, very, very painful, very hurtful. We saw a corruption with Maria that we had never seen before because Puerto Rico, one of the things that Puerto Rico, we heard about the experiments that had been conducted in Puerto Rico throughout the 121 years that the United States government has been in Puerto Rico. Now we also have to deal with what is happening and the kind of corruption that exists in Puerto Rico that makes those moments very, very difficult. All of a sudden it was discovered that there were warehouses with materials and they were going to sell those those materials they were not going to give them to the people and and they were using the the storage places to make money with them so it, it is a very very corrupt system and and it's painful so that moment this moment is one that we we say well, okay we we had a wonderful victory in july but right now we have to again try to get rid of those people, those people who are in government in Puerto Rico, who don't, don't have 
the, the, the spirit don't have the, the, that thing that is so essential, the, the love for Puerto Rico, the love for the, for the Puerto Rican people, the love to make Puerto Rico the nation that it has the potential of being. So when we look at that, and, and it's not only unethical, but very insensitive, very, 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 very much, uh, you know, in a, in a way that dehumanizes, dehumanizes our people. So I, I think that right now that is we, we uh, you know, gravitate, we move from one thing to the next, and it's painful. I think it's very painful to see Puerto Rico, especially in the Southwest, where the the the, the uh, earthquake hit, hit real hard. That that to see our people like that uh, is painful, and I think that. Um, uh, we hope that just like we did with Maria, that we put ourselves out, we, we worked, we worked with work, and there was at least a moment, you know, there was a period of time when we began to feel a little bit more comfortable. But let me, let me, one point that I want to make uh, at this moment. The day that the governor, the present governor of Puerto Rico went to Guanica, she, she was looking, there was this lady, uh, uh, she was uh, uh, lying on a, on, a, on a bed, and she was talking about something that had nothing to do with the, with the pain and, and the suffering of that woman. Never, never, never got close to her, uh, never said anything that was positive to her. And then, and then on, on a different radio station, we were listening to the mayor of Juanadilla, and he's talking about one thing. He said, we're still in Juanadilla, have over 500 homes with tordos. That's, those are the plastic covers that they put after Hurricane Maria. So we can see that we don't have, you know, we don't have the people with the spirit to continue. FEMA came to Puerto Rico, and he, that, that problem should have been resolved. It would have been e very easily resolved. But no, again, again, a lot of money was wasted. A lot of money was wasted. Workers from the United States going into Puerto Rico who did very little work. And at the same time, we still have homes that are very, very vulnerable. People living under those conditions, again, are being dehumanized. See? <laughs> Al frente, ah, claro. Una, una, una de las cosas, una de las cosas, me voy a tocar el frente. Ah, ahora estamos bien, ¿verdad? Eh, oye, buena idea, tremenda idea. Our second question. Many people inside the United States are more aware of Puerto Rico today than has been true in a while. Yet much of this awareness is premised on the idea that Puerto Ricanos are US citizens. What do you wish everyone in the US understood about Puerto Rico? First of all, uh, the, the Jones Act that allegedly uh, gave Puerto Ricans uh, this false uh, citizen of the United States. There is no such thing as a Puerto Rican who is a citizen in Puerto Rico who is a citizen and exercises his power as a citizen in Puerto Rico. Not a single Puerto Rican can say with, with, uh, with the facts behind can say that I am a, a, an American citizen, that I am a U.S. citizen. Why? Very simple. From the very moment, from the very moment that the Jones Act put out that lie. Up to today, nothing has changed in the relationship of Puerto, Puerto Rico. They say, what is the territory of the United States? Well, what is a territory? We are objects, not only, not only is the, and, and let me co correct something. Puerto Rico is not an island. Puerto Rico is a small archipelago. You have Vieques, you have Culebra, we have places where are populated besides Puerto Rico, the island. Your know, people keep on saying the island of Puerto Rico. No, no, let's be honest. Puerto Rico, somebody decided to say that, that 
Puerto Rico, la isla de Puerto Rico. No, tenemos a Vieques, que es una isla, y tenemos a Culebra. We have Vieques, which is an island, and we have Culebra, which is an island, where people live. And if we look at the history of both, both of the, those two islands, we will find exactly why Puerto Ricans are not citizens of the United States. Both islands, for World War, for World War II, were transformed into military bases. Half, over half of the population of Vieques was taken out of, out of Vieques. More than half of the of Puerto Ricans who live in Vieques were displaced in order to create a military base in Vieques. And the same thing happened with Culebra. In 1972, 1973, there was a big struggle, and finally they took the military out of Culebra. But they, it's been substituted with something else. And I'm going to uh, explain what that substitution is. Uh, P Puerto Rico, right now, is being gentrified. And Vieques is being gentrified, and Culebra is being gentrified. Gentrification, gentrification is also a displacement of people who live there, and replaced by people who are buying and building there. And if we, if we want to see Puerto Rico, and see Puerto Rico from the perspective of Puerto Rico as a citizen of the United States, we're not looking at the reality of Puerto Rico because no Puerto Rican is a citizen of the United States in Puerto Rico. There's a difference between the diaspora and, and Puerto Rico in that respect. Uh, uh, there is no difference between Puerto Ricans here in, this, in the diaspora and Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. The only thing is that in the United States, yes, you can vote for the president of the United States, you can uh, elect uh, your own uh, officials. That makes a difference. But Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico, is not, Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico are not citizens of the United States. PROMESA, the financial management board that Obama created in 2016, has cut wages and tried to privatize Puerto Rico's electric grid and university system. How has the financial austerity impacted Puerto Rico, and how have people responded? Probably one of the most serious problems that we have is, is what happens with law PROMESA, or PROMESA law. We, I won't go, I'm going to start with the University of Puerto Rico. The University of Puerto Rico in the, in, the, in the 60s was a very dynamic university. We will go there and we will have fun. We will go there to study, we will go there to learn. But at the same time, we see now a university that, that is collapsing, thanks, thanks primarily to the games that have been played with a debt that nobody in Puerto Rico can say, I know what that debt is, because Puerto Ricans, we have been asking for an audit to the debt. We have been told no, no, no. We, are, we do not know where the money came from, or where the money went to. We do not know how the money was spent, and we do not know how in the hell we have a $74 billion debt and the conditions in Puerto Rico, rather than improving, have gone from bad to worse. And, and there is a reason for that. There is a reason why the conditions in Puerto Rico during the last 30 years have gone from bad to worse. One of the, one of the, one of the uh, 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 one of the laws that uh, was passed in 1984 prohibits Puerto Rico from being protected by bankruptcy. Puerto Rico could be protected by bankruptcy, but in 1984, a, a bill was passed that, that from that moment on, Puerto Rico would not be protected from, from going into bankruptcy. So what, what, so what, what happens? Well, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico has to go under something. And, and according to the Congress of the United States, which is the one that has all the power over Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico does not govern itself, it is the Congress of the United States that decides that, and the legislative branch under Obama, they decided to put to pass out PROMESA law. 
But at no time was promesa law something that was going to defend and hope and help and push to make Puerto Rico at least give the opportunity to Puerto Rico to get rid of that debt, to, to definitely, definitely defend Puerto Ricans' interests rather than the interests of the, the hedge funds and the banking industry. The hedge funds, the people, the people who put that debt into Puerto Rico, and, and there was a time when this, this whole usury, this whole thing of, of, of usury was, was against the law. You could not lend money and exploit and exploit and use that money to exploit. The only ones, the only ones that really were uh, using usury in the United States was, um, was the mafia. They will lend money and you know, they will lend you $50 and they will charge you 150 for the 50. So you know, if you didn't pay, they'll break your legs. But now in Puerto Rico, it's, it's worse. You know, it, it is the government, this, this is a decision that was made in the Congress of the United States to impose a law to create a body of seven people who do not give a damn about Puerto Rico. Not a single one of those persons who is a member of the Fis Fiscal Control Board gives a damn about Puerto Rico. All of them, all of them, every single one of them has an interest, an interest in making sure that the debt gets paid, plus, plus an interest in getting that money into the hands of the hedge funds, into the banking industry, into those who have money and, and have found a way to make more and more money like Donald Trump. It's, it's, it's a question of being con artists who are good at it, real, real, real good at exploiting people, at getting people, getting money from the, primarily from the working class. Because in Puerto Rico, the ones who really pay for whatever is happening in Puerto Rico is primarily the working class. So I, th I think that when we look between the, the, the times 30 years ago, that the University of Puerto Rico is very functional now, the money, the, the budget of the University of Puerto Rico is constantly, constantly being threatened. More and more students are being forced to get out of the university or to take two jobs in order to pay for the tuition. Every, every, every year the tuition goes up, goes up, goes up. And at the same time, the salaries that those, those students are getting is never $7.25. It's about $5 what they're getting. So, we are, we, are, we are being used in a way, and abused in a way, that is incredible. How can in Puerto Rico, how can in Puerto Rico live, a person lives with $5.50 or $5.25? And those are, those are students. And sometimes, sometimes in my office, you know, I find a couple of students you know, come to talk, and it, is, it breaks my heart just to listen to them. Tired, tired, because they have two jobs, tired because you know, they're, they're students at the university. And that is painful, that is painful. Why should we allow human beings to be, especially, especially the youth of Puerto Rico? Because the youth of Puerto Rico represents the future of Puerto Rico. And we have to be aware of that. And I think that what they're doing constantly, 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 is trying to uh, do what something, uh, something that Don Pedro Albizu Campos mentioned in the 30s. He said, el gobierno de Estados Unidos no está interesado en la, solo está interesado, el gobierno de Estados Unidos solo está interesado en la jaula, pero no en los pichones. So all they wanted was the land, all they wanted was the water, all they wanted, the, all, uh, everything that is there, all the beauty that is there in Puerto Rico. And, uh, but he, the, the people were dispensable. We have been dispensable from the moment that the United States government put its foot in Puerto Rico. We have been dispensable, we have been disposable. Those of us who have served in the military know how dispensable we are. The whole thing of military, we, we went into, into the military because we were forced to go into the military, not because we wanted to go into the military. Many of us, many of us did that, you know, we, 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 it was a choice between going to federal prison and, and going to, to, uh, to, to, to the military. And unfortunately, 
When, when I got drafted, they, you know, it was for Vietnam. They needed uh, cannon fodder, so they sent us, you know, we got drafted and sent to Vietnam. But I think that the, over, the, over, the overwhelming moment in Puerto Rico right now uh, is it, the, the whole thing of, of, of the, the byproduct of the earthquake and how the system of education is being destroyed. And, and without, without a system, a viable system of education, there is no future. Because it's education that helps us to create and develop the human resource. And the youth, and the youth in Puerto Rico definitely represent the future of Puerto Rico. And without a good education, we're not going to have that person prepared to take and lead Puerto Rico. Okay, hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricanos have left the island in recent years to escape debt and climate change. You were part of the earlier generation of diaspora um, Puerto Rican. How does this growth of the diaspora impact Puerto Rico? And what does it mean for Puerto Ricanos who stay as well as for those who come to the US or go elsewhere? The, the first thing that, that we notice nowadays is the brain drain. A lot, of, a lot of Puerto Ricans, a lot of professional Puerto Ricans uh, have been forced to leave Puerto Rico. And, and, and the, uh, a good example uh, are the doctors, the nurses, the professionals, the engineers, who, who are literally, literally don't have an opportunity in Puerto Rico. The university system in Puerto Rico forces, the, the way that, has, that exists right now, forces professors People who are prepared to leave Puerto Rico because the, even, even when they're higher, they're higher part-time, they're higher with a very, very low wage, and they cannot live with, with the amount of money. The cost of our cost of living in Puerto Rico is very high. So it, it, we have that problem, and we have to face that. The, the, the way, the way that that diaspora uh, uh, started from the very from the very first moment that that the United States put their foot or their boots in Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans were supposed to be taken out of the island. In the year in the year 1900, a program was started to get Puerto Ricans, and a lot of Puerto Ricans were sent to Hawaii. A lot of Puerto Ricans were sent to the southwest states of the United States. Very few people discuss that. Why would they be sending Puerto Rico? The, the, the rationale that they used was that Puerto Rico was densely populated in 1900. But there were less than a, than a million Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico in 1900. Now, th th there are over 5 million Puerto Ricans outside of Puerto Rico, there's probably 2.3, 2.2 million living in Puerto Rico. And how, how this, this whole thing happened? Well, I think that Albizu was right when he said they want, they want the cage, but not the birds. It's, it's a question of getting the natives out of their homeland. If we go to Hawaii right now, in 1893, the United States government went into Hawaii. Little by little, it occupied Hawaii. More and more people from the 48 states went to live in Hawaii. And the same thing in Alaska. And when it was convenient for the United States, when there were people, enough people that they could say, hey, they can benefit from this, they definitely, definitely said, OK, now is the time to make Hawaii and Alaska states. But if we were to go into a prison in those two states, we will find that the overwhelming majority of the prisoners will be the natives in both places. And if we go into a federal prison in the United States, we will see that anyone who comes from Hawaii into a, a US prison will be a native. And the same thing with Alaska. So those are the things that you know, we can see in relationship with, uh, with the diaspora and Puerto Rico. Now, can the diaspora, can the diaspora really play a very important role in Puerto Rico? I would dare say yes. A lot of us left in the diaspora, a lot of us went back. A lot of us know that the most important thing, the most important thing is to allow Puerto Ricans to be Puerto Ricans. 
If I were to ask the overwhelming majority of Puerto Ricans, and I do whenever I go anywhere to speak, I ask them, I usually ask them how they feel about Puerto Rico. Do they love Puerto Rico? Do they love our culture, our identity, the beauty of Puerto Rico? If we love Puerto Rico that much, it, our language, the beauty of, of how creative Puerto Ricans are, we will say, hey, let's preserve Puerto Rico. And I think that the overwhelming majority of Puerto Ricans outside who left, who have been forced to, to move out of Puerto Rico, definitely still love Puerto Rico. And I say to them, Puerto Rico is the homeland, the promised land for all Puerto Ricans. And every Puerto Rican who wants to go back to Puerto Rico should go to Puerto Rico. And it, it, it probably is not easy, but it's doable. I think we have the potential, we have the human resources to make Puerto Rico the nation that it has the potential of being. And I dare to say that. It can be hard for some people to maintain hope when they see figures like Trump or Rosselló in power. You spent 36 years in some of the worst prisons in the country. Disculpa. Without giving up. 30, 36 years in some of the worst prisons without giving up. And you have been working as a community organizer since your release. What gives you hope for staying involved? Or what, what gives you hope for staying involved all of the time? When I, when I decided to you know, it's a transformation of life. I came, home from Viet I came home from Vietnam. I knew nothing. When I went to Vietnam, I knew nothing about Vietnam. While I was in Vietnam, I promised myself to definitely, definitely learn what Vietnam was all about, what the war was all about. And when I came home, every book that I could find, any information that I could find dealing with Vietnam, I would read, I would share with others, we would talk, we would discuss. But Vietnam's history is a very beautiful history. It's a history of people who dare to struggle. And they, uh, uh, the whole thing of 1954 with Dien Bien Phu, when the French, who are as arrogant as the uh, Donald Trumps of this world, uh, you know, they, thought that, uh, they, they thought that they had defeated, that they had absolute control over Vietnam. And then when we, when, if we were to read Von Gia and the way that he organized, bringing all that thing from the north, all that stuff from the north into the south, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the French who were for sure, sure there, that they had control, found themselves defeated in 40, 40 some days. So, uh, I, one of the things that I made clear on the 17th of May, 2017, was that that our struggle for Puerto Rico, for Puerto Rico's independence, has to be an act of love. We love Puerto Rico. We love our way of life. Let's let's make sure that we understand that whatever we do in Puerto Rico, to defend Puerto Rico, has to be an act of love. For me. When I started to change, when I was loving Puerto Rico, but also loving, loving freedom and justice. And I, I, I am a total defender of, our, of a struggle for a better and more just world. I'm not only concerned with Puerto Rico. I'm, I am doing what I have to do in Puerto Rico. Whatever good we do in Puerto Rico can be uh, passed on to others, to other countries, to other people. If we, if we do something positive, we, if we discover something, we can share that. And for me, the, the whole thing of Puerto Rico and the struggle for Puerto Rican independence has to be an act of love. Without love, we cannot go anywhere. If we allow ourselves to be victims of hatred, put hatred into our hearts, we will be carrying a weight that we don't have to carry. We can get rid of that. Get it out of your system. Get it out of our system. And, and we can definitely, definitely Making Puerto Rico, make Puerto Rico this beautiful, beautiful, uh, is, it will be a garden of Eden in the Caribbean, not only for Puerto Rican, but for the whole world. Can we have about 
about five minutes for questions, and I can, um, you might have to come up because this doesn't stretch that far. Um. Maybe we can take a couple of questions at a time. <coughs> Oscar, my name is Marisol Berrio Miranda. Soy, llevo aquí muchísimos años. Huh? Oh, no se oye. Mi nombre es Marisol Berrios Miranda y siempre he sido una independentista. Eh, llevo aquí muchos años de profesora. Voy y vengo a la isla eh, lo más que puedo. Y una de las cosas que me ha, acabo de llegar, y una de las cosas que me, me ha conmovido sobre mi pueblo, de lo que usted habla del amor, que es lo que es más importante para lograr la independencia de Puerto Rico. Es como nuestra gente, aparte del gobierno, se han tirado a la calle a buscar sus propios recursos. Todos esos recursos que nos, se, han, se nos han negado, que por ley nos pertenecen, pero que se nos han negado. Y cómo la gente ya, por ejemplo, en adjuntas con los... Es, eh, sistemas solares de energía, con, con, con la agricultura, con los grupos de reciclaje, la juventud, como usted dice, no las hemos, desde, ya ya no soy tan joven como era, ¿verdad? pero en nuestro momento siempre hemos tenido esa, esa capacidad, esa pasión por querer que Puerto Rico sea de los puertorriqueños. Y como usted bien dijo, nos están sacando para poder hacer todos los golf uh, parks y todas esas cosas. ¿Qué usted cree y cómo usted ve esa, esa reafirmación del pueblo de meter mano con lo que hay, con lo que se tiene? Y, y un placer y un honor hablarle. Gracias. Uh, Primero que todo, gracias por estar aquí. Es tanto un privilegio como un honor tenerlo aquí presente ante nosotros. Uh, voy a hacer la pregunta en inglés para que todo el mundo pueda entender bien. My question is regarding all of us from the diaspora who left our home uh, in search of better resources for ourselves, right? And who see everything that's going on from far away and have this feeling of hopelessness. Um, and we, you know, aim to return. My question is, what suggestions do you have for us to deal with this sense of hopelessness when we turn on our TV and we see everything that is going on at home and we know we can't return for a while? One more question. Hola, saludos, Oscar. Mi nombre es Xavier, llevo aquí cuatro años. Eh, los dos partidos principales en Puerto Rico, los mayoritarios, eh, estaban mencionando en Fuego Cruzado hoy en el programa que están tratando de impulsar este, para que haya una actividad de manera indirecta o directa para con las elecciones de Estados Unidos. ¿Cómo nosotros acá la diáspora aquellos que creemos en la independencia de Puerto Rico, podemos ayudar, ya sea integrándonos en la política de Estados Unidos e insertando nuestro punto de vista, dado a que las personas que están en, estado, en Puerto Rico, involucradas en la, en, la, en la política de Estados Unidos, son mayormente anexionistas. Y sabemos cómo el anexionismo ha, ha impactado negativamente a Puerto Rico. Eso sería todo y muchas gracias por estar aquí. Primero, primero, primero que nada, first of all, I want to make a point that throughout throughout the years that I spent in prison, whenever I would get a letter and the person would talk about hopelessness, I would say that we have no option to lose our hope. We have, we have, the option that we have is to 
get ourselves into, into all the communities, into the most marginalized community, into those who are usually, usually even, even pushed to the side by us. Get in there and allow them to appreciate the potential that is there in Puerto Rico. If, if we were to go into a community that is dysfunctional, we, we can do it, we can change that community as long as we have hope, as long as we have the strength and we say, we can do it, we can do it, we can do it, we can do it. Never lose hope, never. Never, never lose sight of what makes things possible. What makes things possible is our own effort, our own struggle, our own way. If we have an experience, share it and say, let's, let's move forward. Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is, and the diaspora. The diaspora is probably, probably where Puerto Ricans are looking to and looking to with the hope that we can come together, with the hope that we do not forget our roots, with the hope that our culture lives on no matter where we are at. We could, I, I had an experience in, in Minnesota. They, they, one doctor from Minnesota asked me to go to Minnesota. And, and for me, you know, I said, what, 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 am I gonna, what am I gonna do in Minnesota? What am I gonna tell the people? <laughs> so so, so I, arrived, I, I arrived in Minnesota, and, and you know, it was St. Paul. And all of a sudden, the first meeting that I had was about, about 40 young people. And not a single one of them was born in Puerto Rico, not a single one. And they could sing Bombay Plena. <laughs> they could, they, mostly all of them were bilingual. Most all of them, mostly all of them wanted to be in Puerto Rico and wanted to help Puerto Rico. There was one young man whose mother was Native American. He was Puerto Rican, and he was part of this, uh, this group that was playing Bombay Plena. And I'm talking to him. He says, well, I can speak Spanish. I can speak English, and I can speak my mother's language. So if a Puerto Rican in St. Paul, Minnesota, the son of a Puerto Rican, can say that, then we can do practically anything. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so from the side of the side of hopelessness, let's let's say that's not an option. You know, perder la esperanza nunca, nunca es una opción. To lose our hope is never, never, never an option. We have to move forward. The whole thing of of PNP and PPD and the whole thing of how Puerto Ricans can participate in in a in 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 a way in a way that would probably bring strength to Puerto Rico and to where Puerto Rico should move the direction that Puerto Rico should move. I think that within the diaspora, we have had, for a long time, Puerto Ricans who have done a lot of things on their own, pushing Puerto Rico, pushing Puerto Rico. Sometimes we never hear of them. But Antonia Pantoja, who, uh, who founded Aspira, one of them, Domingo, Domingo, uh, se me olvida su apellido, Domingo algo. <laughs> ese, ese señor, you know, that man was all, you know, very, very, very committed to Puerto Rico for years and years and years and years and years. But if we go to New York with our Arturo Schomburg, we, found this, we find this place in Harlem, in the, in the middle of the African-American community. And Arturo Schomburg did something that nobody else, no African American was doing. He did something that is there. So if you want to go and see it, Centro Cultural uh, 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 Arturo Schomburg, but we can see it. And you see a Puerto Rican who made a contribution in the uh, 19th century. That's when he started in, in, in Harlem. If we look at uh, 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 Miriam Colon, 
uh, this is a woman who was an actress and who created Teatro Jodante and created a bunch of Puerto Rican artists behind her, you know. And so we can help each other here too, you know. It's not a question, but it's a, it's a way of how we can give strength to ourselves to help each other. Solidarity in this world is a word that we should constantly have in our vocabulary. We should have it because when there is solidarity, we work together. It, I, I, have no, I have no qualms to go into struggle in support of African Americans. You know, in 1967, where a doctor, when Dr. Martin Luther King came to Chicago, and he was going to go into Marquette Park, I, I, I knew absolutely nothing, nothing about what the struggle was all about. And all of a sudden, I see this man, one man, walking in, in the middle of the street. And then I see the residents of that community who were policemen, majority policemen, and uh, uh, firemen with weapons on top of the roof with rifles on the sidewalks, walking with 45, those uh, uh, beautiful, uh, not beautiful, I shouldn't say beautiful, very shiny 45s. And I, coming back from Vietnam, I felt naked. I said, what, what, what if they start firing? What am I gonna defend myself with? Because I was told that that activity had to be a peaceful activity, that nobody could wear an arm or anything like that, and there was, it had to be, we had to tolerate whatever came our way. And when I saw Dr. King walking, with that serenity, with that uh, so sure of himself, I said, well, if he does it like that and he's not getting killed, but I can do the same thing. I can walk uh, alongside and go, go there. It, it is sometimes the example that is set and the example that Dr. King gave us is a wonderful example. Uh, he got killed, but he left behind a legacy and we can follow that legacy. So. It, the, the word, uh, for me, solidarity is very, very crucial. It should be, and I, I tell Puerto Ricans, let's, let's, let's put that word into our vocabulary and into our heart because we can be in very, very strong solidarity with what's going on in Puerto Rico from the diaspora, but we can also be in solidarity with those who are around us. If we, if we have something, we can share it. And at the same time, it's the way that we can move into the creation of a better and more just world. Because we have to do that. We cannot allow ourselves, in Puerto Rico, we cannot allow ourselves for, for our beautiful place to be, to be destroyed. And let me tell you something that, that was happening when Hurricane Maria took place in Puerto Rico. We, we, I, I usually go to Loiza through Piñones. And all of a sudden, I see all this heavy equipment and all this big things pulling trees, uprooting trees from the side, from the side of the of the of, the, of the, that uh, avenue that goes from from uh, San Juan into into Loiza, uh, all along Piñones. So we stop and we ask them. I mean, I'm talking about a good group, probably 50 workers from the United States. So we we uh, we ask them. You know, what 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 are you people doing? And uh, he said, Well, no, it's none of your business. So, and and uh, there were uprooting trees, and those trees are the ones that save. They hold the sand back, and that prevents the sand from coming into a, 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 an avenue that you know, is, is, is the only way that we can communicate in, 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 with vehicles all the way from San Juan to Loiza. So those things that happen, I mean, they're destroying something that, has, that benefits Puerto Rico, and they were getting paid for rooting the trees. So it, it is that thing why we need to be conscious, be conscious of the things that we need in this world. One of the things that we have to look for is in harmony with Mother Nature. And when we, when we find ourselves in a, in a hurricane or we find ourselves in, a, in an earthquake, it, it is a way of Mother Nature letting us know that she exists. And that we need, we need, we need the water, we need the trees, we need the plants, we need the sun. We should protect everything that makes life possible, that makes all life possible, not only the human life, but all life, all forms of life. 
And I think that when we think along those lines, then we can definitely defeat anything. And I think that when we think along those lines, and uh, we look and we see Puerto Rico in the conditions that it's in, and we see Puerto Ricans who do not want to be Puerto Rican, like Ricky Rosselló, who said that if all Puerto Ricans would step out of Puerto Rico, would be kicked out of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico would be more beautiful. That's the mindset of a young Puerto Rican who was governor of Puerto Rico. And that's the conversation that he's having. And how in the hell are we going to permit such a thing to happen? Why would we allow this individual to insult us the way he insulted us? And I think that the Puerto Rican people show us that they had the dignity, they had the indignity and indignation to say, hey, listen, you are going out of office. And for the first time in our history, a governor was taken out of office. And we did it, and it's important. There, there's one, one more thing, you know, again, getting back to the whole thing of statehood. People can be whatever they want to be. If, they, if, if Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, they, if they say statehood is the answer uh, for Puerto Rico. But when they say that, what, the, 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 what they don't realize is that when they say that, you know, they, they, they're completely out of Puerto Rico. Then they're not Puerto Ricans anymore. So to say to say that Puerto Rico, oh, you know, Puerto Rico can be annexed. We were annexed 121 years ago. We have been we have been a colony of the United States for 121 years. And I, I want to make a point out, you know, just just to say, what is a colony? What is a colony? A colony is the most dehumanizing the most oppressive, the most destructive entity, the most destructive political system that we can find. There is no democracy in, a, in, any, in any colony. The, the, the people who are colonized have never been allowed to exercise that beautiful human right that is the right to self-determination. Because we decide as human beings what is going to happen. We should have that right. It is, it is a violation of a human right. It's a crime. And, and it's very, very clear that colonialism is a crime against humanity. That is according to the United Nations. And we should make sure, make sure that we say, hey, stop that, because you are perpetuating a crime. And that's a crime that should be eliminated. In, in uh, 1988, the, the General Assembly passed a resolution, Resolution 4347, alleging that all colonialism was going to be eliminated in the world during the decade of the 90s. And we are in 2020, and not a single country has been decolonized. All colonies have continued being colonies of the United States and of the world. So, we have to continue struggling to end colonialism in the world. And one of our struggles right now, the pushing in Puerto Rico, is we want to take the case of Puerto Rico before the General Assembly with two, with two primary issues. One, that in 1953, the General Assembly accepted the lie, the farce, that Puerto Ricans, because they were all of a sudden declared Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico, that we had exercised our inalienable right of self-determination. And no Puerto Rican, no Puerto Rican can say that. So since 1953, the UN accepted that Puerto Rico was taken out of the list of countries that had not achieved the uh, independence that, that, that uh, were supposed to be by the United Nations supported to get their independence, and Puerto Rico was taken out of the list. And that was a farce, that was a lie, that Luis Muñoz Marin, the other side of the other government of, that is still in Puerto Rico, because we have the, the annexionists, but we have somebody like Luis Muñoz Marin who started the whole thing of Estado Libre Asociado. There is no such thing. There is no free associated state. There is a colony of Puerto Rico. The Congress of the United States has absolute power over Puerto Rico. We can look it into the law and we'll see that. 
We do not rule anything in Puerto Rico. The government of Puerto Rico is in Washington, D.C. They can tell, we can, all we have to do is look at Ley Promesa and see why, do, why are Puerto Ricans suffering on the Ley Promesa. Because that was the creation of the, uh, not of Puerto Ricans, but the creation of the Congress of the United States. So we have to be conscious and aware of what it is that we're facing. And so I think that it's very important, very important to in, in Puerto Ricans who are in the diaspora, they can see themselves and say, we can, you know, we, if we want to go with a party that is defending Puerto Rico's independence, then we can go with that person. If that person is sincere, well, we can, we can uh, if, 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 if the person wants to vote, hey, let's vote for that party that, that definitely, definitely defends Puerto Rico. Because the interest of Puerto Rico is not represented by the Congress of the United States. If we look at La Promesa, the interest of Puerto Rico is not incorporated, of the Puerto Ricans, not incorporated into La Promesa. If we look at every law, if we look at every structure that the United States government has is, uh, instituted in Puerto Rico, every structure, every structure has been for the benefit of the metropolis, not for the benefit of Puerto Ricans. They took away from us. From, 18, from 1890 until now, it's been taken away from us, ripping us off, ripping us off, and we should not tolerate that. Thank you all uh, very much for, for coming. Um, I want to give uh, Oscar uh, a minute to drink some water and, and relax. So rather than congregate up on the stage, uh, if you'd like to get a, a book signed or, uh, or a photo, um, if you could um, say hello to him in the hallway uh, where we'll be selling books. Um, let's please give uh, Renee and especially Oscar Lopez one more uh, round of applause. <laughs>